Hello, our friends, Evolutionary Energy Arts family. We hope everybody is doing awesome today. As always, welcome back. We're always Now I'm always going to double check, make sure everything is taping <laughs> fine, make sure nobody remotely shut us off. Yeah, he's staged, but you know, you never know. You, you know. never know. And so we have with us a friend of the family, a friend that's been with us uh, for quite a while. And Richard has quite a story to tell. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's one about overcoming and, you know, we, we love to do these type of things and sh we want to share more of these type of stories of personal, personal crises that lead to spiritual illumination and awakening and then overcoming the difficulties and the challenges. So welcome Richard. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mike and Cindy. It's, it's great to talk to you. I'm looking forward to it. And, uh, Really, I'm just excited to be able to share my story, my testimony with the family, and um, I hope it helps one or more of you out there. I'm sure it will. As you know, there's always people that are going through different dark nights of the souls uh, at different times. But in these times, with everybody going through ascension, there's kind of like almost a universal dark night of the soul that we are facing right now. There is. There's so many people going through so many different things. And, you know, the most important thing, I think, when you're going through this is that you're not alone and that there's other people have done it. And there's so many inspiring stories out there. And Richard just had one that was super touching. And wow, gave me chills. Amazing. So do do okay. share do share with us, because I think you've been following the channels uh, since the original channel, Evolutionary, and since I was in Florida, I believe? Yeah, that's correct. Yeah, that's correct. When I first uh, started watching, you were in Florida. It was the Evolutionary Energy Arts rather than the EEA Arts. Um, and really, I just, I loved your calm demeanor. It was a great juxtaposition to my mind at the time where I was trying to still kind of make sense. And I was in the midst of that dark night of the soul and trying to climb my way out of it or kind of find my new center, so to speak. And and I just found a lot of your content to kind of help not only put pieces together, but just uh, it, it was going over things in such a calm way that it was a way for me to kind of take a cue from your energy and be like, okay, there he's, he's noticing everything I'm noticing, but he's very calm about it. And he can just kind of be aware, but yet not in fear. And so that's, that's what was my big motivation, you know, is to get out of fear, whether it was any realm of my life, whether that was, you know, fear of losing my life, fear of losing my job, fear of not following the right faith, you know, whatever it was. Um, it was just I found a lot of solace in what you guys were sharing. Well, we're we're glad it helped, and you know that's that's the bottom line is trying to help others because, yeah, you know, we have to shift the paradigm by shifting the individual paradigms one soul at a time, one person at a time. You know, awakening to the bigger picture. But then, even though we're facing all these challenges, and these challenges look to be the biggest ones we've maybe faced in six thousand years or more. At the same time, there is this other side where things are really getting better, and you won't find that in any news. And, you know, that's really something that perhaps, you know, on purpose, we're being distracted from seeing, you know, the soul growth and evolution that's going on at this time period. I, I think you might be hitting the nail on the head. I think there is, um, you know, it, human distraction and, per, and instilling fear or like where where you're in that fight or flight mode, which you know we'll get into this probably later but with my story i was pretty much perpetually putting myself into fight or flight every day for close to 12 years and just like total survival mode and when you're in that mode it's very hard to be truly spiritual because you're so caught up in literally just survival trying to get yourself physically through the day to where you can go to bed that night that that you know it's very hard it's felt very hard but it also helped me find my spirituality but it's very hard when you're in the midst of it to have any type of real spirituality and what i feel like society is going through is everybody's finally going having to face number one the fear of the virus right because it's everywhere 
right? And then, the, and then the fear of death is ultimately what the fear of the virus is. So people don't want to hear that any amount of death potentially to them or their family is okay or going to happen without having somebody give them a warm blanket to say it's going to be okay. And so it's just kind of this mass psychosis of we're all going to die, and that's a fact when you're born into this world. And I feel like society is just having a, a hard time accepting it because they've been forced to accept it at the same time. Yeah, yeah, it's it's most definitely a wake up call and challenging. And then again, we also have the media going on, which is all about fear, constantly about fear. And you know, this channel has also been uh, accused, you know, hey, you're nothing but just fear mongering because there are those that want us just to focus on, you know, what's 5D going to look like. But at the same time, you have to realize. The majority of people are not awake. You know, more people are awake now than there was a year ago. That's for sure. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. You know, and that's part of the reason why we're seeing such a splitting uh, between the people that are awake and the people that aren't awake. And then even amongst those that we would say are awake, you know, still many still have, as, as I was equating it to Linus going around with his blanket. You know, there's certain aspects that we just have a hard time letting go of because it brings comfort. And, you know, that could be most definitely something from, from our religious upbringing. Um, but at the same time, if it's something that causes division, that's not a good thing. Because uh, we have to right. find the unity. You know, we have to find the unity. But, you know, there are saints in every religious background. You know, there, there are saints from a Christian background. There are saints from a Hindu a Buddha, you know, you'll find these individuals that won't get bogged up in the minutia that will just rise above and see the common unity of all things from any tradition. And, and many times these are the people that there's so many legends about being able to do amazing miracles. It's because, you know, it's not the dogma. It, it's, it's, it's the unity underlying everything that they're tapping into, regardless of what tradition they come out of. And that's a beautiful thing. And, and so often when people go through, um, you know, overcoming obstacles, overcoming addictions as well. And obviously addictions can be a, a huge obstacle. And, you know, Cindy, though she's never been an alcoholic, she used to go to Alcoholics Anonymous because she loved the sharing and, and the open heartedness that would be going on there where people would be bearing their souls to each other and learning and growing. Well, it, it was so important for me because I knew that I wasn't alone in seeking escape from reality. And that's really what addiction or alcoholism is about. It's looking to escape. I can't do this. but And, and I found that solace with other people. And they gave me such wonderful ideas. And I gave them really good ideas. And those were probably the best times in my life was going and talking with people who had real life experience. And no matter how bad your situation was, somebody else had it worse and they could tell you how they got through it. And if they did it, you can do it. Couldn't agree with you more, Cindy, on that. Um, you know, that was kind of um, step one for me. I had my opinions of what AA or NA must, uh, ha must have been. Uh, unfortunately, um, you know, I had experienced uh, alcoholism and addiction first as a child with w witnessing my mother struggle uh, for many, many years. Uh, and, and she was going to AA. So I kind of well said, how, how much can it help? Because it didn't help mom. But when I finally got my butt in there and started, just like you said, hearing the openness that people were speaking with and, and then the, the truly like wise and loving counsel they're receiving back uh, definitely was like, a huge, a huge boost. I mean, I don't know where I would have been without some of the people that I met in those rooms that I, and some of the testimonies that I heard to kind of pick me up off the floor and say, okay, I can try to do this one more time, you know? Well, that's a beautiful thing. So please do share your story in a little bit more detail with everybody so they can understand where you came from and what you went through. Sure, sure. So, um, again, my name is Richard. I'm 38 years old. Um, uh, live in Brookfield, Wisconsin. I was pretty much born in this area, my, my born and raised my whole life um, in southeastern Wisconsin anyways. Um, 
And when I was 21 and engaged to be married to, to my current wife, um, I got in a huge snowboarding accident. I pretty much was in a snowboard park on a jump. And to, to spare you guys the long-winded explanation, I pretty much got hung up upside down and landed on my head on the back of the jump and uh, herniated three discs, uh, my C6, C7, C5, uh, C5 C6, and C4, C5. Um, so, and, and did a lot of other damage. I had indentations in the inside of my lips for my teeth. So I was in a lot of pain. Um, and so I was prescribed pain medicine and I was prescribed it for about four or five months. I can't recall exactly how long it was, but eventually I was not prescribed it anymore. And I had grown number one, accustomed to it, taking away the pain so I could sleep at night and it, and it helped me sleep and unwind at work. So I wanted to keep taking it, so then I pursued it on the street and uh, eventually got addicted to Oxycontin, which I'm sure so many people have heard about or know somebody that may have fallen into that same trap. And I went through the whole rabbit hole you've heard about um, and then some. So I was pretty much exclusively taking pain pills for probably eight years of my 12 years of addiction, um, at which point it got so hard to financially afford to still continue to get Percocet and Oxycontin that I just switched to heroin. And for the last four years of my addiction, I was using heroin. And obviously that leads to just you making terrible decisions in life. My wife was at her wit's end. She had stood by my side for eight years um, and just watched me get, you know, go further and further into it. And she was, she didn't know what to do. She was trying to like stand in faith and, believe that I was going to eventually get to the other side, but everything I was showing her was making her think like I was on a one way track to death. And, uh, sorry, I get a little emotional talking about this, but, um, and so long story short, uh, I proceeded to, you know, go through everything you've heard about. I got kicked out. I was pawning my my family's living room TV and the Xbox that I had just got for my daughters, I pawned a month later because I needed to get a fix and my wife would keep all the money in an account that I didn't have the name on it because she was trying to do everything she could. I mean, that's the level of struggle and chaos that we were at. Eventually, I ended up getting pretty much kicked out of the house. I was living out of my car, begging for money in the middle of winter in Wisconsin to try to get enough gas to at least be able to start my car up a few times and warm up throughout the night. And uh, that kind of led me to my wits end where I, again, you know, I, I tried multiple times to get clean. Um, and so I tried again and they put me on Suboxone again. And I always felt like it was a never ending story. I was never going to get off. And then eventually one day me and my wife got in an argument and I said, you know what, I'm going to go, I hadn't used in six months. I was clean, but um, I said, I'm going to go and just use intentionally. And I know that I haven't used in six months and the amount I'm going to use, it's probably going to kill me. Well, I went and used and it turned out to be 100% fentanyl, not heroin. So when I already was taking a dose that was capable of potentially killing me, fentanyl being 50 times stronger really killed myself so i took it and i was trying to drive 40 blocks up the street straight home i died 30 blocks in and went through a pole uh you know the car was totaled landed on top of the pole luckily a cop happened to be right there who broke the window out and hit me with narcan um and they had to hit me three times with narcan i kept dying and then they'd hit me with narcan i'd come back so like I was dead in the car when he found me and then he narcan me, I came back and then I, you know, then he, then he moved me to the ambulance and then, you know, and, and it's weird because I know it, I know all this happened because I was like seeing it, you know, like it was, it was very odd. I was never in fear throughout all that. I didn't even remember the accident because I had died in the car before I hit anything. Um, so the whole experience was really confusing mentally, but I, I didn't really realize what was going on at the time, but I was like having an out of body experience, like witnessing what was happening from like, like a bird's eye perspective. So I'm seeing myself, you know, getting the cop leaning in the car and, and trying to get me out of the car. I'm seeing myself. I'm, 
and my wife and kids actually showed up at the scene because it was right down the street from my house and her, she was looking at find my phone and my phone was showing that I was sitting in the middle of an intersection forever and so she drove like thinking I had thrown my phone out the window um, because I was so angry, she and then she saw that I was there. So my wife and kids were getting held back by the police while I'm getting loaded into the ambulance. It was a very dramatic scene and day. So pretty much, I tried to commit suicide. I succeeded, and for whatever reason, you know, God chose to give me another shot to make it right. Like rather than let it end as bad as it was about to end that day, like that would have been the last memory my kids had that would have been the last memory my wife had and it would have been in a moment of anger and rage you know at mainly at myself but regardless it was going to have this ripple effect you know and it was like i saw that i felt all that like i realized like this is this is what you would have had to live with like in the afterlife knowing this is how you chose to go out you know like as an addict you know um, giving in to the addiction, tapping out, leaving your wife, leaving your kids, and then suddenly, poof, I'm narcan and I'm back because they brought my physical body back, but with a medicine, right? You know, so it's like, and that happened three times. So by the time I came back, I was so overly emotional from like probably DMT that had been roaring through my body, to be honest. And I, I'm having this crazy experience and i'm just like overflowing with tears and sadness and like true sorrow for the decision that i had made like true regret like okay i need to fix this like this i don't know why i'm here still i don't deserve to be here i've lost three friends including my brother-in-law to this addiction so i felt incredibly guilty that i had lived and they had died I mean, I was, but I wanted to make it right. And I figured the only way I could make it right was to beat it. And so I left the hospital um, the next day and uh, made a decision to, you know, try to change my life and, you know, started getting into counseling again, ended up going to rehab called the Bluff Plantation in Georgia. And they, I mean, I didn't really know what I was getting into, but, you know, it was 45 days of like no sugar in your diet, no nothing, um, no any mind altering, you know, like substance. It was just like, you know, clean yourself out type of deal. And uh, and I made it through that. And then I went uh, to like, a, uh, what would you call it? like a halfway house for 30 days with, a, uh, you know, like me and seven other guys. Um, and I, so I stayed in Georgia for over two months because I knew if I went back to Wisconsin, there was a higher likelihood that I would make a terrible decision and go out and use. So I was scared to come back. And so I finally came back. Uh, it was, you know, after a, a 30 days, it was like 75 days, it was 45 days in rehab and then 30 days in like the halfway house afterwards. And then I came back and continued therapy here in Milwaukee and November 2nd will be my three year uh, anniversary of no heroin, no opiates, no nothing. And I guess, you know, that's my try. That was my, uh, shortened version of my beauty, beauty from ashes story, I guess. Well, that's definitely quite an experience you went through. And, you know, I, I'm sure just the fact that you were outside of your body, that knowing that, alone changes the lens we view everything from does it not oh yeah yeah um the fact that i never felt any fear the fact that i was like i'm still here but and even when i came back i i came back and it was the strangest thing it's like uh you know you hear people talk about a knowing and then you think you've experienced a knowing but when you come back from a near-death experience you really know something that like like life would have never given you an opportunity to know while still living you know you've been shown a window that most people won't get to show like everybody wants to know for sure what happens on the other side like right that's that's you know everybody's big deep dark secret and when you have a near-death experience as terrible as they are for whatever reason you get to them um and i would not <laughs> encourage anybody to go out and seek a near-death experience in any way shape or form but 
when you when you unfortunately have one of those experiences, I feel like it 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 can't not be life changing because how do you explain the fact that you never didn't exist, but you know your body was physically dead? So if if you're just an animal and just a pile of carbon with a that just happens to you know have this these thoughts that aren't conscious or aren't tied to a spiritual body, then why was I never gone? Because I died three times that day. Why was I never alone? Why was I never scared? Why did I never experience darkness? I didn't. I didn't get thrown into a fiery pit. I didn't have a conversation with God, uh, showing me every negative thing I had done. I felt regret because I realized, oh shit, I'm not going to be able. To, excuse me. Um, oh crap, I'm not going to be able to see my kids like and give them a hug again and give. And I'm like, my wife's going to. It was regret for that, but it wasn't regret for me. It was a regret from the separate. I like. I was very aware of the separation that I had caused, but I was also very aware that I was still existed. I don't know how else to say it. And in fact, you know? and in fact, you you didn't really change. You were still you. It was just like a continuing circuit of typical thoughts, but a big realization at the same time. Correct. Correct. Yeah, it was like a light bulb going in it. And I came back, and the, the main thing I remember, I mean, I'm, I'm sure I would have been emotional no matter what, but I was, like, emotional because I knew, like, okay, maybe not everything in these religious textbooks is true, but we certainly live on. Like, yeah, maybe man's dogma has, has taken a right turn or a left turn here, uh, you know, at who, who, what man hasn't made a, a, a wrong decision. So I can't even necessarily fault him for that. But what I can say is the essence of what's in all of those books, with the essence of what they're trying to teach all of their cultures, is what I experience is that you life goes on, that this is just a, a season. And a, a, I truly believe it's a school because the lessons I learned, you wouldn't be able to learn if you were eternal from, you know, from if you just got eternal life here on earth what could you possibly learn because you could never have any consequences from your mistakes mm -hmm. yeah. and if you don't have consequences you don't have an opportunity to learn well you know think about this going in with our memories wiped it's like we have real skin in the game so to speak and that we don't know for sure most people don't know for sure and i i've shared that when i was five and coming back from the funeral of my brother who had passed on, who was 11 years older than me, he was 16 when he died. And I remember staring, just standing there staring at the kitchen wall and in shock, just thinking, I'm never going to see him again. I'm so used to him being by my side, you know, reaching out my hand and having him put his hand in my hand. And then I was out of the body and I was just kind of looking down at my body, looking at the wall. And I think it was my guide's helping me to, you know, to basically say, you know, he's going on. He's still there. Uh, he's just in a different uh, place. He's having a different experience. Now you go on because you're eternal. And so I, I had that like out of body because of my grief for him uh, not being there anymore. That changed me. So I always knew from that point forward that we go on i just knew that you know it was mm -hmm. it, it just like you know it even though you know you obviously had a, a an incredibly severe experience that was you know so traumatizing but there again you never were not you and there wasn't as you said no just blackness and nothing you were watching your body you were watching the scene and um I have three other friends besides you that were all clini clinically dead for, for prolonged periods of time, as long as 35 minutes. One was toe-tagged and brought to the morgue, and then they came back. Wow. And wow. They, they all shared the same thing. They were watching their families start to cry and to grieve, and they were watching everybody freak out. And meanwhile, they were kind of like, but I'm here. And, and then feeling bad also, like, wanting to be with them. Um, right, right. So that's so interesting that you say that. It's it's uh, it gives me chills just to hear that other people had that similar experience. Or I guess my testimony is in line with theirs. It's it's I don't know. It's always cool to hear stuff like that because it lets me know like that wasn't just some figment of my imagination or 
some my brain's way of coping with the trauma that was happening. Like I, I, I know what I know, and it's it's really encouraging to hear that it's in line with what others have said. Mm-hmm. Absolutely, absolutely. It's it's kind of a universal experience. You know, there there's been a few cases of people that have had negative uh, near deaths, but I do tend to think again, it depends on, on where they are vibrating. So you know, if they are somebody, you know, that their soul is vibrating perhaps at a much lower frequency, or their belief system is so impenet- impenetrated with that belief that. You know, I'm a guilty sinner. I'm going to go to hell. I'm going to go to hell. I'm going to go to hell. You you could drive yourself into a lower experience. Now, you were obviously in a lower vibrational place, you know, at that time. But you're not a low vibrational person. I know your soul's not either. And, you know, obviously now you're totally changed and you have a much greater understanding of everything around you and how the universe works. You know, it's interesting. That's that's really well said, number one. And number two, you know, if you would have ever told me, say, four years ago when I was still in the midst of, uh, of trying to get clean and feeling like I'm never going to do it, no matter whether I try to go to the doctor and get the medicine that they give you to quote unquote get off or I try to do it myself, I'm just never going to be able to do it. And and I kind of lost all hope in myself. But what what ultimately you know, ultimately, somewhere along the line in that, you know, there's like a spark that's that got ignited, you know, and then when that spark was ignited, um, you know, it was suddenly went from I'm not going to be able to do it to I'm going to do it or I'm going to die trying. And that's when the change happened for me, you know, because I'd rather die and have to face you face my own mirror, so to speak, right? And, and say I died because I was trying to get sober and of the withdrawals or whatever, then then continue to die in the addiction because then I'm, you know, I'm in the mess still. And so that's what the determination was for me to get me off the center and, and get me moving forward. And then when you have that experience, I'm honestly thankful for it. Thankful for all the pain, you know, um, you know, I wish there were things I could do differently. I wish my kids didn't see me do some of the things that, that they saw me do. Um, but they're so loving and forgiving, and, and we've had honest conversations about it at this point. You know, um, open. I'm very open with them about it in my testimony, so they know why they saw what they saw. Um, and it's just, I would, I'm thankful for it all. I wish, like I said, they didn't see some of it, but the the lessons I've learned and the knowing that I have is worth almost more to me than any any i can't pick a tangible item outside of my family who i know i'm going to always be with um whether it's here or or off world um when that day comes for all of us like i know they're going to continue to exist too but i think what what i'm what i cherish the most is like the lesson you know i just hope that that lesson um could get shared with more people you know, because they take all the magic out of life and they beat it um, out of out of life. And they make life just about, you know, ones and twos and, and true and false and red and blue and uh, left and right. You know, all these all these things. And it just beats the magic uh, out of the world. And I just I think when you have an experience like that or you have an out of body experience or you get deep in meditation where you're we're sitting there and you're listening to the birds chirp and you're having the wind blow over your you know your face and your arms and you can have an experience where you're just grateful for sitting on the earth and feeling the wind blow against your arms when you've been panhandling for money to try to get by and keep yourself from freezing at night you know um i'll always be able to find a reason to be grateful and the average person that hasn't faced adversity unfortunately has to struggle with the fact that they haven't faced adversity and so they sometimes can have a problem finding stuff to be grateful for, or they can find it easier to complain about all the things they don't have because they've never really experienced true lack. Once you've experienced true lack, you can always find something to be thankful for. Most definitely. You know, if you've got a roof over your head, you should be think. you know, you, you should always be able to find something. Well, making that gratitude list can be so, so important, even if you're not feeling it in the moment, you know, they have those sayings, 
fake it until you make it. There is definitely something to that to get the get the brain synapsing. And for people who have hit that rock bottom, you know, I understand for one because I have had my own struggles. Hitting that rock bottom can be such a huge, huge blessing because there's really, truly nowhere to go but up. I mean, you're just down. You are leveled out you know, nothing is going to change. So everything from that point forward becomes a huge blessing in your life. And then you start piecing things back together and you learn about the gratitude. And sure, we plateau out, you know, we have times when things aren't so great, but then, you know, you reach back in all those tools that you've gained from climbing back up from rock bottom, you know, now you have those. And I think we live in a society where we're not giving given these skills to cope with the way things are so much like policy and procedure, policy and procedure. Things have to be this way. When we are very intuitive beings, we are not human doings. We're human beings. And they've put us in these situations that don't even fit our soul. And then we're supposed to be normal. You know, I just think that the that having the ability to cope with the world that we have to live in is so important. And I wish that they would teach it from kindergarten, but that's not their agenda. So that's why I guess we need to really watch out for ourselves and our children and teach them these coping skills, these important skills like gardening and cooking and things that really get you through life and how to meditate, you know, and then that brings me to the point where like spiritually, how important is your, your spiritual practice now, you know, as opposed to then now that becomes your lifeline. Right. Right. Yeah. My, if, yeah, I wouldn't know. I wouldn't be where I am without the spirituality that came along. I found my spirituality somehow, like you said, at that rock bottom, mm -hmm. um, whether, whether the rock bottom forced me to kind of push through some of the paradigms and really just set down the dogma or the anger you know i almost had anger towards religion um towards the end because i was so you know there's a scripture in the bible that says that god will kill a kill the body to save the soul and so i would i would say that to god every night before i went to sleep and then when i woke up and i was still living the next morning i would proceed to curse god out with every curse under the sun and call him, you know, an SOB for not keeping his word because I was still living. I mean, that's the depths of where I was at. But somewhere along that, I chose to pick my shield up, pick my sword up and fight again and give it one more chance and just make sure it was one honest chance. And if I died on the battlefield, so be it. But I was going to I was going to try one more time, one more times for myself. And that was who I was doing it for more than anything. But then for my wife and my kids and just legacy. Um, you know, not as an ego thing, but I wanted to leave a better legacy than, oh, father of two that um, had a great loving wife who we never appreciated and, and you know, used and, um, you know, you, you know, used drugs and, and lost. I didn't want that to be, you know, my story. Um, but but if had I never found spirituality, I would not be able to have ever done it. You know, if I wasn't watching messages of encouragement like you guys provide, um, you know, or or there's so many others, too, that that just messages have have helped me. I can tell that there's other light workers out there. So many of us have had traumas. And so I find so much like peace in hearing others testimony and, and others perspective. You know, when I listen to a video, I can like almost pick up a, a vibe of whoever's making the video. I almost kind of like. It's almost like I'm sitting in a room talking to that person. It's very weird. I, I don't know if that's like a, a spiritual kind of like gift or whatever, but like it's just weird. If I watch a video or even hear somebody's voice on a podcast, I just kind of kind of pick up how they were feeling while they were saying it. Um, and so many, so many people just kind of help me understand like everybody's, you know, going through this. Everybody has that dark night of the soul. Everybody has that rock bottom. And it's about what you do with it. You know, you could hit a rock bottom because you lose a job and you, you know, I had to file bankruptcy too because that accident, I didn't have car insurance. So not only was it like medical and addiction and like marriage, but it was going through bankruptcy. I mean, but bankruptcy alone can be enough to push people over the edge, right? And it's just how are you going to handle that adversity? 
And, you know, I think you've got to dig down deep. You've got to rely on your spirituality and you have to walk in faith. Like, that's that's your part of this. You have to get up every day and trust that, you know what, you're going to have what you need. Yeah, and now, and now it's not even just faith with you. You have a knowing, mm-hmm. you know, and the knowing is what changes everything. Right. No, that's a good, good, good correction, actually. <laughs> See, yeah. you know, and it's a beautiful thing because, you know, the vibe that you put off that, you know, we know, and it's the same vibe that I've gotten from others that have gone through this experience. They're just changed at the core. It's almost like you've kind of gained a cheat code in a game and, you know, you have an insight that others don't have, which allows you to perceive things from a, you know, a certainty. So now you know, hey, you know, I screwed up in the past, but one of the biggest things is forgiving yourself. That is one of the absolute biggest things. You know, not dwelling on what I did, but, you know, now I'm going to be that best partner, the best father that I possibly can be. And I feel that in you. I can feel the the energy come off of you. So, yeah, I've, I've felt like you're a brother the whole time. And there's people that we deal with, too, uh, on a regular basis that have gone down similar paths and, you know, are on varying stages of that recovery path right now. And these people, you know, they might have used some of these hardcore drugs. It, it doesn't change their souls from the fact that they're still starseeds and light workers. Mm-hmm. You know, can this happen to a starseed? Can this happen to a light worker? Absolutely. It could happen to the best of us. Oh, definitely. Definitely. You know, I understand that a lot of beings that chose to come as volunteers on this planet didn't have the understanding of how, what they might come up against and not having the ability to have coping skills for the planet that you're on. You could imagine you're going to turn to what works, you know, whatever that right. might look like at the moment. Yeah. That's what it was for me. You know, is that's, that's unfortunately what, you know, if I were to say what, why, what was the, what was the driver of my addiction? It was coping. I wanted my brain to shut off. I didn't want to, uh, you know, have those constant spinning thoughts of, you know, different fears, right? I just, and, and it was the, all of a sudden like that off switch for me that I never knew existed. And I was like, oh, well, this is convenient. I can just turn my can of care, you know, or, or shut, you know, shut my care window whenever I want to, and then I can just make the world go away. Mm-hmm. And, you know, but the unfortunate part about it is you, you lose yourself, you know, it'll work for you for the first couple of times, and then you work for the substance the remainder of the time. Yeah. And there's so, so many different things you can use. Like if you do have depression, PTSD, things that cause trauma, so you grew up with trauma and a lot of our traumas do come from childhood and, and they still exist in growing up. There's different plant medicines that can really help the brain regrow. It's like super minimal doses to help you regain those coping skills too. And just other it's other it's healthy interesting habits. that you say that. Oh, go ahead, Mike. No, Sorry. no, go ahead, Richard. Your your line of thought. I was just gonna say, Cindy, that's interesting you say that because that's actually something I did incorporate as well. Was was I believe you know psilocybin like you're talking about? I assume you're talking about that. Yes. Um. So I actually grew my own as a way to kind of like grow my own medicine rather than take the somebody else's solution from an orange bottle. Um, so yes. that was a big part of what Good helped for me. You. I think. That gives me huge chills. I, I, I'm so proud of you for looking out for yourself and understanding that, you know, all of these things in the orange bottle, they're not for expansion. Like Mike was talking about earlier, that's to help shut the brain down. So we don't discover who we are. And, and we don't even really need the substances, I, I think, at the highest level, um, although that could be a step. And it, and it can help. It definitely can help. There's been so many studies that show that some of those things can help. Um, we can also do it through meditation, through yoga, qigong, tai chi. Any sort of mind-body uh, exercises is wonderful. And, you know, for me, too, like for so much of my adult life, you know, got used to having a glass of wine before bed to help fall asleep, although there's been 
long periods of time where I won't have that glass of wine and I'm just as good. The trick is to make myself physically tired by working out really hard uh, every day. You know, work myself out to where my body is going to be wanting to just go to sleep. Mm -hmm. And then learning some meditative techniques, like I will just basically pour breathe or breathe through the crown chakra or the third eye chakra in a meditative state while I'm lying down. That's what I do is when I go to lie down in bed at night when it's time to go to sleep, I focus on drawing in energy through the crown chakra, which also ties me to the higher self so that the downloads and where I will experience uh, myself traveling to in sleep is not going to be of a lower vibrational quality. It's, you know, I, I really don't get nightmares, although I will get visions at times, mm -hmm. you know, visions of some things that are coming, you know, quakes, natural disasters, or man-made things as well. Um, but for the most part, this has enabled me to, you know, fall asleep without anything. And, uh, you know, maybe a sleepy time tea or something like mm -hmm. that. You know, it's again, a, we could overcome addiction by replacing it with something that becomes a healthy habit as well. You know, like literally physically working out, which we should be doing five or six days of the week just to stay at optimal health overall. When you exercise, you know, you, your, your body is giving off good endorphins and it's, it's helping you to achieve a natural high. And when you do things like yoga and qigong, it, it changes the brain pattern, enables you to switch out of fight or flight, get into the rest and digest side of the nervous system. So all those things can help us to, you know, be able to quiet that mind. Like what you said, quieting the mind, that's a big thing. Oh, it is. It is. And it was incredibly hard for me at first. I mean, I'm kind of a, a hyper person that's just the way I came out of the womb and um, you know I've got a lot of energy uh, you know usually I'll like sit and walk around even if I'm on the phone or something I'm um, just that that's just me I probably put like you know a ton of steps 14,000 steps or, or something like that on the average day but but and then I'm constantly working but I just have been always go 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 and so for me to to learn how to meditate and I I really learned I had watched videos on on YouTube, and I had tried to do it on my own. But when I went to Georgia in rehab, there was a one of the therapists there was really big fan of Eckhart Tolle, and he would run an hour long session where he would either put on an Eckhart Tolle video in the beginning, and then we'd do a meditation at the end or something along those lines. And that's where I started to really kind of like seriously try to do it. And that was revolutionary for me to find, but, but I mean, it was a struggle when I first tried to do it. I was like, yeah, right. My mind's still thinking about everything else. Da, 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 da. You know what I mean? You don't get it your first time. Um, but once I truly started to learn how to, that I'm not my thoughts, you know, and, and just how much peace there is in the present when you can get yourself into that state where you're just, you're just sitting in your backyard on, on the grass. You know, there isn't anything else going on in the world. You're not worried about Tomorrow, you're not thinking about yesterday. You're just there, and uh, when when you when you finally get to that moment, that alone is so peaceful uh, and so beautiful. Not to mention, like the you know out of body experiences and stuff like that that you can get into with really deep meditation. So, and that's a beautiful thing. And now you're in the same position as we are in that you've just moved to a new house and. You know, you're getting yourself situated and getting yourself prepared for everything else that's going to be heading our way. Yeah, yeah, super, super thankful. You know, I guess that's the last chapter of my testimony, I guess. It's mm -hmm. that, you know, keep the faith, you know, and that you can. We had lived in the city for in Milwaukee, um, you know, which is a big city. I know it's in Wisconsin, so people don't think there's big cities up here. But Milwaukee, I assure you, is like it's uh, Chicago Junior is how I would describe Milwaukee. And, um, you know, uh, well, a lot of drugs and everything. And, and uh, we finally got out, you know, we were able to sell the house. and We moved into an apartment so we'd be able to be a more attractive buyer. You guys know the drill, right? It's a crazy yeah. market out there. And we were able to luckily, uh, and by, with sources help, uh, you know, get, get the house. And we're just settling in and loving life. That's beautiful. Well, thank you so much for sharing your story. Hopefully it will inspire many. 
Yeah. And, you know, it's a testimony, again, to what can be overcome. Absolutely, absolutely. Don't lose faith. And, you know, to anybody out there that's that's in the situation, uh, you know, just put one foot in front of the other. Give yourself a break. That's the first thing. Give yourself a break. Stop beating yourself up. And, you know, that no matter how dark it seems today, there's still there's still a light at the end of the tunnel if you start walking towards it. And one thing I always like to say, if you're listening to this and if you're having trouble and you just don't know what to do, stop and look around and just do the next right thing. Amen. Great advice. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Richard. And thanks to everybody that's listening to this. We hope you find it inspiring. Thank you for your support on Ko-Fi and Patreon. We couldn't do it without you guys. God bless and namaste. Namaste.